My name is Sanjay Gupta. I'm a cardiologist in York. Today's video is entitled Fatigue, Mitochondria and the Energy Puzzle. Right. As many of you know, I've spent a large part of my career working with uh, patients who suffer from a condition known as POTS, uh, Postural Orthostatic Tachycardia Syndrome. And one of the things that this has allowed me to learn is that what you read about conditions in textbooks is very different from what the patients who are living with these conditions describe. So if you look at the books, the definition of POTS is basically postural orthostatic tachycardia syndrome. They say that when the, when the patient stands up, their heart rate goes very fast and they don't like it. And that's all it basically means. However, when you talk to patients, they say, my condition isn't just one of standing up. I am troubled all the time. I feel rubbish all the time. It's not just when I stand up. Sure, I feel worse when I stand up, but even when I'm lying down, I'm tired. I have brain fog. I have temperature dysregulation. Um, and this is something that bothers me all the time. I never wake up feeling refreshed. And so I started thinking, well, if it's not just a condition of standing up, then the kind of explanation that we used to use uh, to try and explain to patients why they were getting the symptom was that, oh, well, when you stand up, you know, you're, you're, you're not able to get the blood up adequately. It pulls in your legs and that's why you feel like you do. But if that were the case, then why would they feel rubbish even when they were lying down? Why the tiredness constantly? What has the lack of refreshing sleep got to do with standing up? So you start realizing that this proposed mechanism doesn't capture all the symptoms that the patient describes. And so increasingly, I started getting interested in saying, well, OK, if it's not just about the fact that the blood gets there, because the blood gets there, when you do the test, the patients generally have a strong heart, the oxygen that's getting into their body is fine. Then how does one explain their constant fatigue? And this is where I started getting very interested in the concept of mitochondrial dysfunction. So I'm going to speak about this, about our energy or more specifically the lack of it and how mitochondrial dysfunction could be contributing. So as I say, many patients I see suffer with deep persistent fatigue, not just tiredness after a long day, but the kind of fatigue that makes everyday life feel overwhelming. And one of the most overlooked contributors to this kind of fatigue is something we don't often talk about in mainstream medicine. In fact, if you talk to most cardiologists, they wouldn't even know about this. And that is mitochondrial dysfunction. What are mitochondria? Mitochondria are often called the powerhouses of the cell, and for good reason. They're tiny structures inside nearly all our cells, and their job is to convert food and oxygen into energy. So you can deliver the food and oxygen. Your heart is fine. Your arteries are fine. Yeah, the, your capillaries are fine. It can get there, but you need the mitochondria to be doing well, to be functioning well, to convert that food and oxygen into energy in the form of a molecule called ATP. Think of them as miniature engines. When they're working well, we feel vibrant, clear-headed and strong. When they're not functioning properly, even simple tasks can feel draining. It's not about laziness, it's about a biological bottleneck in the body's ability to make energy. What happens when mitochondria don't work well? Mitochondrial dysfunction can show up in subtle and frustrating ways. Perhaps the most common way is chronic fatigue, but they can also present with muscle pain or weakness, brain fog or poor memory, exhaustion after minor exertion, cold intolerance or temperature dysregulation. And actually, when you look at many complex conditions like ME, CFS, long COVID, fibromyalgia, POTS, and even neurodegenerative diseases, these are all symptoms patients complain of. And there is now growing evidence that mitochondrial stress or damage may be playing a central role. Why do the mitochondria get damaged? I think many things can impair mitochondrial function. 
chronic inflammation, oxidative stress, toxin exposure like mold, pollutants, heavy metals. We don't talk about this enough. Nutrient deficiencies, especially magnesium, the B vitamins, coenzyme Q10, carnitin. You can also get it from viral triggers such as Epstein-Barr virus, COVID, etc. And you may also have premature mitochondrial aging or inherited mitochondrial disorders. Modern lifestyles such as poor sleep, processed food, chronic stress can also make things much worse. What can support mitochondrial function? So here's the good news. Mitochondria can often recover, especially when we create the right internal environment. Now, it's not something I know too much about, but it is something I'll be exploring more of, more uh, in the coming few weeks. But from what I have read, nutritional support, such as magnesium, uh, I've spoken about magnesium in the past. I did one of my most popular videos on the channel is about magnesium. And a ton of people have come back to me and said, I found that the magnesium has helped me. It has made me feel better. And magnesium is essential for ATP production. So having enough magnesium in your system is a good idea. Now, the problem is a lot of people rely on a blood test. You know, you go to your GP, they'll do a blood test on magnesium and they'll say, oh, your magnesium levels are normal. The blood test is not a reliable way to know uh, whether you have enough magnesium or not. And therefore, in some ways, it is perhaps just a good idea to supplement with magnesium. It's, it's generally harmless unless you're taking it in absolutely huge quantities and you just assess how it makes you feel. So magnesium is very good. Coenzyme Q10 is supposedly very good. It supports electron transport. L-carnitine helps transport fatty acids into the mitochondria for fuel. Alpha lipoic acid, a powerful antioxidant. B vitamins, especially B1, thiamine, B2, and B3, niacin. Creatine may also help buffer short-term energy into muscle and brain. And D-ribose, a sugar that helps regenerate ATP. There are some studies underway to look at this in a more sort of controlled, randomized study. But, but these are the things that are actually generating a lot of interest in, in, in the sort of scientific world as possible ways by which one could improve mitochondrial function. Gentle movement, even light activity like stretching or slow walking can stimulate mitochondrial biogenesis, creating new healthy mitochondria. But this must be carefully paced in patients with post-exertional fatigue. It's of course very important to reduce oxidative stress, which uh, damages the mitochondria. So antioxidants like glutathione, vitamin C, N-acetylcysteine may protect the mitochondria from damage. Good sleep, clean air, reducing chemical exposures can also help. I was in a meeting and I heard a wonderful, wonderful uh, Dr. Sarah Myhill speaking and she talked about heat as a way of getting rid of heavy metals which may accumulate within our body. So she talked about the benefits of sauna. I don't, again, have to confess I'm not as knowledgeable as her, but I will try and find more out and then share that uh, with you guys. Cold exposure and light therapy as well can be helpful. So therapies like light, um, like red NIR light photobiomodulation are being studied for their ability to stimulate mitochondrial function. And then of course, mind-body practices. So chronic stress affects mitochondrial health. Mindfulness, deep breathing, relaxation techniques can lower the biological burden on these tiny powerhouses. So if you're someone who feels tired all the time, who feels unseen because your blood tests are normal, but your body tells a different story, you're not imagining it. You may be living with mitochondrial dysfunction. And the good news is there is hope. People are becoming interested in it. And there may be some simple things you could do to improve your mitochondrial health even now. It's not a quick fix, but it could be a turning point. So if this video resonated with you, please share it with someone who may need to hear it. And if you'd like to hear more on this topic, deep dives into individual supplements or strategies, let me know in the comments as I, I have to confess, I'm not an expert at this, but I'm open-minded and I would very much love to learn. Uh, and I'm, I don't very much believe in 
the fact that modern day medicine, the way the medicine I practice in my day job has the answers and therefore we have to be open minded. We have to be collaborative. And so if anyone has had experiences with um, some of these uh, supplements, perhaps that have helped uh, improve energy, please share them. Let us know so that we can all learn and perhaps someone else who's reading the comments may also want to try them out. You know, I think as a disclaimer, I'm obliged to say that you must check with your doctors, uh, etc., before you do anything. But um, certainly, I think this is a very interesting area for us to be looking at. Thank you, as always, for being here. I wish you strength, clarity and the steady return of your energy. All the best.